Welcome to Just Healing, where we rediscover humanity and our conversations around trauma and celebrate all the unique ways we love and heal. I'm one of your season two co-hosts, Michael Munson. Trauma doesn't exist in a bubble, and healing shouldn't either. Let's listen, let's learn, let's heal. Going into the body is not just about uncovering your trauma memories. It's about uncovering pleasure, joy, goodness, love, like vitality. You're in a body that can do really cool things and can feel really amazing things. And we will definitely say hello to the hard stuff, but we were also going to have greater access to the really good stuff that makes all of this worth doing. Hey everyone, um, this is the next episode of Just Healing. I'm Michael Munson, one of your season two co-hosts. Um, I'm really excited to be um, able to introduce all of you to Molly Bader Harris. And Molly, I think that we just talked about this at the last time we did this um, together. We were kind of in opposite roles, so it's it's yes. fun to be asking the questions this time and and listening. Yeah, I know yeah. I get to be nervous this time. <laughs> Don't need to be nervous. None of us need to be nervous. Um, why don't we start by just kind of asking you to share a little bit about who are you? What kind of work do you do? Who's the Breathe Network? What is the Breathe Network? Anything that gives people an idea of, of you. Um, I am a survivor. That's how I came to this work that I'm doing and work that we'll be talking about today. And um, as a survivor of sexual trauma, I spent, um, like so many of us, I, I felt like, okay, well, I got to do something with this energy that I have now that I, what I, I know what I know about the world and um, the experiences of violence in my own body and in the bodies of so many people around me. How can I, what can I do with it? And for me, activism was a way to get involved and I was one of those folks that got involved as an activist and then it kind of quickly turned into, this is my career now. So I worked as a medical advocate and a legal advocate at a couple different rape crisis centers. And, um, you know, after many years of that, it, it took a toll on me um, physically and psychologically and like, spiritually and just started to kind of impact my own healing trajectory. And I think a lot of that was just the just the demand of wearing a pager seven days a week um, and having that no no rhythm in my schedule, not sleeping well, being exposed to traumatic stress and those high shock states that survivors you know are in when we first are seeking out services. So I moved away from that towards the academic space and worked on college campuses, thinking that that would be easier on my system. And in ways it was because I didn't wear a pager. I, ha I had like less on call, but in other ways it was more challenging because I had an activist spirit and that wasn't necessarily held on a university campus. Um, so I wasn't surrounded by all of my advocate survivor peers who were like fierce about this work. I was surrounded by people who had placed my office in like the darkest corner of the campus possible um, and wanted me to just quietly do my work behind the scenes so I could feel like that didn't feel right either and um, you know and I but I just was like what is my what is my role and um, throughout that I was also teaching yoga and I was trained as a yoga teacher and I started working more and more with survivors and I felt like okay what I love and what kind of nurtures me as a survivor is healing. And I wonder if I could find a way to stay in the movement with a focus 100% on healing. Um, and I saw that there was a big gap in the movement to end sexual violence when it came to helping survivors heal physically, um, spiritually, relationally, like there was this short-term acute psychological support that you might be able to access if you had the privilege to access rape crisis services, um, which we know most of us don't have that access or we carry it with us for many, many years or decades, and we don't see ourselves as identifying with the population that maybe our local community-based rape crisis center serves. So 
Um, so that's when I created the Breed Network, which is a national nonprofit that is dedicated to ensuring uh, trauma survivors, sexual trauma survivors, access to sliding scale, trauma-informed holistic healing. And I wanted it to include as many healing modalities as possible because I have this firm belief that there's no one-size-fits-all way to heal trauma, that it impacts us on all these different layers and levels. And I also felt that, um, you know, yes, things like yoga or body work can be therapeutic, but it also has so much to do with the delivery of care. And so ensuring that our providers were trauma trained was an essential component, um, which I know we'll talk about later, you know, what that looks like. So now we have, we have about 125 members and then we have a lot of non-members who are just connected to the network that we refer to and we offer individual services. And then we offer a lot of education and training for healthcare providers, healing providers, and resources and courses for survivors as well. That's a lot. <laughs> That's yeah, a lot. It, it is yeah. a lot. It is a lot. And I am our only staff person. Um, mm. So it's quite a bit. And I hadn't realized some of your history of where you started and how that trauma of being on call all the time. I mean, that is just so incredibly hard for, I think, everybody that does that role. Um, and I, I can see where that would be kind of moving into some different space for you uh, on that personal level, as well as just the, the goodness of that you're doing to the world, with the world, about where you've ended up now. So Yeah, yeah. One of the things that I really love about this podcast is that I get to talk to lots of fun people, um, people that are really kind of different in their backgrounds. Um, so you're very different than some of the other folks that are in the series, um, which is just fantastic. When I was checking out your website ahead of time, which I check out a lot. Um, so mm -hmm. folks that want to go to it, it's thebreathenetwork.org, and we will put that in the in the captions. Um, your mission says, I, and correct me if this is wrong, that the Breathe Network supports survivors of sexual trauma with trauma-informed holistic healing practitioners and programs. So for some people, some of those words might feel unknown or or unclear can you talk about like what does trauma informed mean within the breathe network yeah so trauma informed you know i will speak for myself and the organization knowing that so many practitioners come to it with their own personal sort of definitions or understandings but from my perspective to be trauma informed in this work means that you have a clear understanding not only of how individual experiences of sexual trauma combined with maybe systemic or generational experiences of trauma, sexual or otherwise, impact a person physiologically, um, psychologically, spiritually, socially, but you also have um, ways that you can adapt your practice and tools to support people in really contextualizing what they're navigating, holding them through it and giving them um, person specific tools to help them recover, you know, knowing that recovery for many of us is like an ongoing journey and there's not like an end point, but finding ways to help people to live more um, in, 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 in their sense of agency and authentically. So, um, you know, it's, it's for me, it's like when somebody comes in, I'm not just seeing, oh, here's a body in the room that wants to do yoga. I'm thinking about all of these aspects of their identity and not just the trauma parts. You know, I'm also like, if I'm trauma informed, I'm also like, it took a lot of resilience to get in the door. So I'm also like one of my teachers said once, Peter, Dr. Peter Levine, he said, I don't work with trauma. I work with resilience. And that for me is another way I think about being trauma informed. It's like, we're not just focusing in on all of the wounding. We're really helping that person see, and we're holding it until they can see um, the incredible capacity they have, which is demonstrating the fact that they made it to our space, you know, all the ways that they're 
nervous system or their body or their spirit fought for its survival in the moment and many, many times afterwards to get them in our door. So that's really how I'm thinking of being trauma-informed. And then, of course, just a deep respect for the survivor or the client and a real honoring of like, what are they here? What are they here for? What do they want out of this collaboration? Because it is a collaboration. I'm not in the role of like, I know better than you. How can they guide this? Like, how can we do this thing together? Um, And how can I really like trust that they're the expert in the room? You know, like I have all this sort of technical expertise or educational expertise. I'm the expert of my own experience as a survivor, but my experience is totally different in so many ways than the next person that walks into my space. So really like being curious, like tell me who you are and how I can, what do I, how I can then show up and meet you where you're at and support you in going where you want to go on this journey. And if it seems like I don't have the tools, once we get going, I'm going to work with you to find somebody who can better support you, which I think is something we also forget about being trauma informed. For me, it's like, it may be recognizing that I'm not the right person and there's somebody else who's going to, who's going to be a better fit for you. And I'm really committed to helping anyone who reaches out to me or to the Breed Network and finding that right person or practice or space. And I'm glad you brought up Peter Levine, who um, if folks don't know about Peter Levine, um, go check out books, videos, so many things. And I love that, that framework of not just looking at trauma, but looking at resilience and um, that's a really, really great way to, um, ground a lot of the work. Um, I was also hearing like, you know, so much of the services that survivors tend to access are hierarchical. They're top down They're Uh, the provider knows better. And, you know, what you just said flips that around and really gives agency to that survivor who who is is walking into your space or into the space to heal yeah yeah um i know you you're you you mentioned that you've got about 125 providers that are kind of in your directory and um i was stunned when i was looking at just how many different types of modalities people are practicing um and i feel pretty in the know about stuff but i was going "Mm, i have no idea what some of these things are so could you share just a little bit about like what some of the providers do and maybe even some some of the ones that people are maybe are are more i don't want to say esoteric yeah yeah and that's such a great question and i and it kind of ties back to something you mentioned which was that word holistic so i want to Uh, bring that into this description, Um, you know, because I think holistic, we hear that language, we hear trauma-informed being thrown around a lot. We hear holistic, embodiment, somatics, all of these pieces. And part of, for me, the holistic piece of our network is that a lot of our providers are coming in recognizing, they all come in recognizing that we're not just a physical body. We're not just like an intellectual brain. We're not just a spirit. If we even identify with having a spirit, like we're all of this. And, and so we need healing supports that can come in and address the ways in which all of these different pieces of ourselves may have been impacted by trauma or may, um, or maybe we've lost touch with those parts of ourselves. For some people I know for myself, I didn't even really identify very much with having a spirit until I was navigating the experience of sexual trauma. And I had this very intense, like what felt like a spiritual experience. It was a a very negative spiritual experience, but I was like, oh, there is a part of me that is like not my body and not up here. And so I really was longing myself to find places where that part of me could also get noticed and named and I could be curious and like bring it back because I was like, this is it was kind of startling, but also fascinating. So, um, so within our network, we have things that people might know about, like psychotherapy. They might know about massage, like just going in and getting body work. Um, they might know about yoga. 
but they might not know about like trauma informed yoga, which is like a little bit, which is sort of taking yoga, but it's taking that lens of restoring agency to the student in this space, recognizing, you know, I think of it as like, they're their best teacher. My role as a trauma informed yoga instructor is to actually step out of the student's way, like to create a container that's sturdy in the yoga space where I'm giving direction and I'm offering ideas and I create a bit of a scaffold so people who are new to yoga or just new to their body don't feel lost because that can be overwhelming if you're too like just do whatever you want to do you some folks really do need that structure but also that at every point they know that they have the um, right to opt in or opt out of something or to adapt so um so we have things like trauma-informed yoga. We have, you know, acupuncture and traditional Chinese medicine, which, you know, some people sometimes think of as like pure energy medicine, but it's also a very physical medicine. It works with the psyche and with psychological, you know, challenges or complexities. And of course it works with the spirit. Um, and, and a lot of our practitioners who offer traditional Chinese medicine, like I love talking to them because the, the holistic nature of the body and healing is just built into traditional Chinese medicine theory um, and philosophy. So, um, you know, if anyone is listening and, and wants more information about any of these modalities, I really invite them to reach out to me because I can point you towards places where you can get more information. Um, what I love about something like acupuncture is that some of our healing practices can feel really rigorous. Like you go to talk therapy and you're going to talk about what happened and, and that can, it's important to be able to, you know, find your words and to tell the story through your lens. Yes. Um, and it can take its toll and it can be hard or yoga, you know, yoga can sometimes feel good, but sometimes it can feel like it can feel achy, it can feel heavy, it can feel just uncomfortable, not even because of trauma, just because we've been sitting at a desk for seven or eight hours, or we just haven't been able to move in a long time for any reason. Whereas I love that acupuncture is one of those modalities that's pretty restful. And, you know, m many folks can kind of rest into a warm table they can use needles, which, you know, are often imperceptible, but sometimes you might feel them or your provider has many other modalities. Like some people think of acupuncture treatments or traditional Chinese medicine as just needles, but there's many other ways that they can work with you um, that don't involve um, the, the boundary breach that is inherent in getting needled, which can be something that survivors might want to build towards over time and they may never do. So I love that. I'm like, oh, it's a healing practice that's so deep, can work with all these systems of the body, but I get to also rest. And we know rest is so hard for those of us who have trauma histories, whether it's in our history or there's ongoing systemic challenges to our daily life. And I think having practices like that, which I also think like uh, cranial sacral therapy, which are you a cranial sacral therapist? I, I'm not, but I, I've definitely done a lot as a, as a consumer. So yes. Yeah. I think of that as another way to get like really supportive body work that unlike massage, isn't doing deep tissue work where you're going to have to work with some of those like discomforts of kind of getting into knots or stuck places. Cranial sacral therapy is often like a really light hold perhaps on the the client's head, maybe holding their heels, sometimes putting a hand underneath their lower back. So the touch is like low touch, um, clothing on, and then really I think of it as like deeply nourishing to the nervous system and helping people access rest, which again, if we, if we have a trauma history, we have, um, we've had to work so hard to just like contend with the world usually without adequate resources, usually with not only our sort of internal signaling of like things aren't okay from the inside, but also the world is heavy and challenging. Sexual trauma or other forms of trauma, whether it's the trauma of like 
racism or heterosexism or cissexism or ableism, like we have all these things weighing on us. And so anytime I think a survivor can access supported rest, it's helpful. And when you have somebody there to hold space for you, I think it makes it more possible. Like if I'm just going to go lay down on my couch or my bed, I have a very hard time dropping into rest. But when we're accompanied, like that is something that, you know, that I always think it harkens back to when we were babies and we had to get taught like in the arms of a loving caregiver, how to rest. And so I think that sometimes that those modalities can recreate the conditions where somebody else has their vigilance up for us. They're looking out mm-hmm. for us. And now mm-hmm. we can drop in. You know what I mean? So I love that about those modalities. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, it, it, it's always fun to talk to you because I think of things differently when when I hear you talk, which is just fantastic. But like, you know, you're so right. Like some of us never learn about what rest is, you know, may not have yeah. had a nurturing parent. Um, right. And you're right. It's different. You know, if you go lay down in your bed, you're right. Can you really get rid of that hypervigilance that you might be like, what was that creak in the house? What was that noise outside? Right. But if you're in a container, you might still hear those noises. But that that other person is there with you. Um, to provide that space, which is really, really important. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to name for anyone who's listening, who didn't have that caregiver, which so many of us did not have, um, or our caregiver was the person who hurt us, um, that, that, that adds another layer of complexity. That is a kind of trust we're going to build over time. Um, And so there's ways that, you know, our caregiver, if they're trauma informed and they have some sense of our history, they are going to know that they're going to have to take their time to build trust. You know, like one of my modalities involves touch work, but for many clients, there's no touch for like a year or two because we need to really build that relational trust and safety before that's going to come on board. And so I just want to name that if this sounds like I would never feel comfortable dropping into that with another person, that that makes sense. And if it's kind of hurts your heart to hear that you should have gotten that, like, I just want to honor, like, like that hurts my heart that all babies did. Like I feel tearful just because I want that for every baby. And then I want to name that because our bodies are so resilient and amazing, this capacity to feel that safety in your body in relationship with another human can be rebuilt as an adult. So you, I have worked with people who are in their 70s, who are coming in for the first time, telling me they've never felt safe in their body. They have never been safe with another person. And we are rebuilding we are doing what my one of my teachers called safety mapping. We're building a new map in their body that lets them know that their body can track for safety signals, not only tracking for danger, but now there's a new map. And this map lets them know when they feel good. This map lets them know when they can relax. It lets them know when they can trust somebody. It lets them know when somebody wishes them well. So I just want to put that out there because it can be so hard to hear these things and to feel like, well, I could never do that. I really believe that we all have the capacity to do all of these things and to restore that innate capacity to be in in co-regulation with others. Yeah. You know, that makes me think about, uh, you know, when I think of trauma-informed practices, when I think of holistic practices and kind of creating that safety map, one of the things that I think about is, is sometimes like survivors may not be able to literally physically walk into the door. Like literally, you know, that they're, they're stopped either from disability or from some emotional reason for not walking in the door. And, you know, I view the really skilled trauma informed practitioners as saying, okay, I'll meet you outside on the sidewalk. We can stand 10 feet apart. And when you're ready, you can come back the next day, the next week, the next month, and we'll stand outside and we'll come five feet apart or whatever. You know what I mean? Like I'm being really simplistic about it, but like to me, when I've experienced trauma informed somatic based practitioners, they're willing to go to that place rather than, nope, got to get in your yoga clothes and you got to get on the mat. And you're, you know, that, that is not what it's about from my experience. And I, I kind of heard that in what 
you shared. Is that is that accurate? We're totally on the same page. Yeah, I, um, you know, I have clients that aren't ready to see me in person when I work with them, and so we work online. Um, they, I give them a little tour of my space. We, um, I have somebody who basically their first time in person, it was just coming by my space, peeking their head in, checking it out. Like, here it is. Now you've had the experience of driving here. Now you get to go. We're not even going to do a session, you know? So it's like, we, um, we have to really respect, you know, so much of trauma is that your bound, your boundaries were breached and, something happened that you didn't get to say no to. And so I really am like, let's wait until we have a full body. Yes. To do anything. And I'm going to trust that we will get there when that person system is ready. And I would never want to do anything to like override that or to Mm -hmm. coerce, coerce them because then I'm just recreating the conditions of trauma. And as survivors, we're going to be vulnerable in this society to wanting to like appease our practitioner. So it's like, as a practitioner, you really have to, you have to be very like mindful of your boundaries, your scope of practice, you know, of your, uh, if you're showing up with an agenda for them and you have to really let go of what you think it should look like so that you can make space for it to look exactly as the survivor needs it to look for them to actually heal. I wanted to pick up on one last, one little thread from the the, the last question too before we move on. But um, a colleague of mine and I were were talking the other day about um, talk therapy and and how um, they're pretty against talk therapy for for their own process and for a lot of the people and the survivors that they know. And you know, we were talking about how it's so activating for people, and you know, oftentimes the the goal is like you need to tell your story, and I need to know, you know, the providers like I need to know all of these things, like somehow they deserve, like they feel like they deserve that information from the survivor. And when you talked about rest, when you talked about that supportive container, it's the exact opposite of that. It's it's like that survivor doesn't owe you anything. Um, they don't have to tell their story with their mouth. They don't have to tell their story at all in any way. Um, and I just think that that's a unique way of looking at how do we heal? It's not always why we have to tell our stories. Um, and I don't know if you have anything more that you want to share about that. Yes. I um, I have my challenges too with this idea that everybody needs to go and talk about what happened For some people, it's like they've spent so much time ruminating about it, processing it intellectually, and that's that's not their challenge. Their challenge is that they're having a really hard time just being in their body on a day-to-day basis. And if we think about the fact that trauma is, like responding to trauma is a body experience that we actually rely on all of these organ systems and hormones and physiological processes to meet the intensity of trauma, to carry us through to some degree of safety, to survive every day afterwards, why would we be up here when this part of the body is offline during the event? You know, it's like, I get so much more information from folks just by paying attention to how their body's doing, how their breathing is, if they're fidgeting, you know, and I think that that's the conversation ultimately trauma survivors are looking to have it's like how can i come back to a conversation with my own body and i don't want to undermine the value of psychotherapy for people because it can also be really powerful if you've never been able to tell your story to have somebody say like that happened that was real and i believe you and it's not inherently therapeutic just like yoga is not inherently therapeutic so i just really you know and it's also like it's not telling it for people that leads to the healing. It's how they tell it. Do they get to be present for the experience of telling it? Or do they have to dissociate to say what happened What happened to them? Which is what so many survivors end up doing is they're like, oh, I talk about it all the time, but I'm never really in my body when I tell the story. And I feel like if the survivor really wants to tell me, we're going to go so slow so that they don't have to leave 
so that they get to come back and they get to own that story. And, and then they might not have to tell it a hundred times. It might be like, I told it one time in a way that felt really meaningful. And now I have other ways of working with my healing. And I, you know, that makes me think too, that, you know, so many times male survivors or masculine identified survivors don't have the opportunity to tell somebody. And so for, for some men, that talk piece is really important because they, they haven't had an outlet, right. but they also haven't been in their body either. Um, a lot of times. Right. So for some people, it's a both. And for some people, it's a one or the other or a one and then the other, um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's this, this process of what does that person need for their healing? One of the things that I heard you say before too, is that, um, I think you said you didn't acknowledge your spirit. Is that the language that you used? Acknowledge. And I think that that's kind of true for people's bodies, right? A lot of survivors are just like, what is my body? I, I don't have any relationship with my body. And so when people think about like, yoga or massage or any of these things, you know, that can be really scary because it's about, it's more about body. Um, so I'm wondering, could you share a little bit more about like, what are some of the benefits? I mean, you've talked about some of them already, but like, why might it be important to be in our bodies or to approach being in our bodies or getting closer to being in our bodies or whatever yeah. it is that is about our yeah. own wellness? Yeah. So I will start by saying that not being in our bodies is also very wise, right? That's how most of us have survived. That's how we definitely survived those acute experiences of being traumatized. And it's probably how we survived a whole lot of other experiences in relationship to the trauma for years or decades afterwards. And it can feel just really devastating to not have a relationship that is reliable or positive with this organism that we're in every single day or to feel like it's working against us um, and that it somehow has betrayed us or that we um, have to be ashamed of of our body because of how it behaved during trauma or how it continues to behave in response to trauma so i think of um you know, body-based practices is being helpful because they address this specific, um, what I call like an embodiment conflict for survivors, which is, I really want to come back to this body of mine. I want to know about it. I want to tend to it. I want to be in it to experience all that it could offer me. But I'm petrified by all of the memories that I know that it holds or all of the big feelings it will unearth if I really pay attention to it. So I think any good body-based practice is going to acknowledge that that's in the room, that there's this ambivalence. Like I'm here because like clients come to me because they want to work with their body. But in the sessions, they're like, I really don't want to work with my body. That's so scary. And so we're just holding that. We're holding that tension of like, I want to, and I don't want to at the same time. And I think that one of the gifts of these practices is a it gives us back the thing that trauma took away from us which is agency which is being able to say this is my body and you will not enter it you will not approach it you will not touch it unless i say it's okay to do so and i think that like as humans we have this innate right and need to know like where we end and where the world begins and trauma makes that so blurry for us or takes it away um the other thing that i think is so important is that so much especially right now so much of the conversation about the body and trauma is all about how the body keeps the score on our traumas and so go do trauma-informed yoga go do these somatic practices and find out all the scores that your body has been keeping on your trauma. Like that is so, I think that creates more barriers to people wanting to do it because survivors, we know what our body has been tracking and that's why we're not paying attention or that's why we've stayed away from it or we've numbed things out, whether consciously or unconsciously. So I like to let folks know that going into the body is not just about uncovering your trauma memories, it's about uncovering pleasure, joy, goodness, love, like 
vitality. It's like you're in a body that can do really cool things and can feel really amazing things. And we will definitely say hello to the hard stuff, but we were also going to have greater access to the really good stuff that makes all of this worth doing. So I think that that's one of the things that is so important for anyone who's like thinking about these body practices is like, it's going to, yes, it will put you in greater touch with the, the wounding, but it will also give you greater access to the things that like help you thrive and be happy to be in a body and give, give you hope and, um, and courage and enjoy. So um, you know, what trauma and trauma takes that away from us. So when we have to cut off the trauma stuff, we inherently end up cutting off access to some of the good stuff that we might want. Like if it's hard for me to be in my body, it's hard for me to connect with other humans' bodies. And not just like around intimacy and sexuality, but like if if I can't feel my own body, I have a hard time accessing the benefit of co-regulation from a really loving body worker or caregiver or friend. So I want survivors to have access to the full range of our human experiences. And I think body-based practices open that up again. It's funny. I, you know, as I, as I'm listening to you, you talk about that and the kind of the joy and pleasure as you were talking, I was, I saw out of the corner of my eye, this really beautiful butterfly. And I'm like, Oh my God, what is it like to feel, to be able to feel that? Like, and that has not always been my experience, right? For those of us who are survivors who live in this really difficult world right now, I'm like, oh my God, what does my body feel like? And 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 I know that's not what we're talking about, but but having done body work as a consumer, that's part of what allows me to feel like, oh my God, there's this cool little butterfly outside. That's totally, Michael, that is totally what I'm talking about. And I think that we want to name that because I think survivors feel like, it's got to be so focused or intentional or in this specific healing space. It's like if you could see a butterfly and be like, oh, my God, butterflies you know. <laughs> are like, yeah. what? Yeah. It's like this right. little caterpillar and he builds his little yes. space and he gets cozy in there. Then he melts yeah. and he reorganizes yeah. and he comes out like, holy, like that. I know. And to feel that is like, I feel I it. Consider, yes. I'm like, you feel it. It's like. This is how this is all connected to us. And of course, butterflies, like they're the perfect yeah. metaphor for survivors yeah. of like, right. we got to go in and we, we got to melt and molt and reorganize and <laughs> right. come out. So, so yep. beautiful. So yes, I just want to highlight that that's it. And like when I'm in sessions with people, if they notice a butterfly in the window, it's like, we're going to allocate time to feel yes. that goodness. Because it yeah. matters and that accumulates the same way the triggers accumulate or the pain accumulates. Yeah. So do those moments of beauty. You know, and the other thing that you you mentioned, which I think is so absolutely critical, is is this concept of like, you know, I think that we enter sometimes into therapeutic practices, no matter what they are, thinking that we have to do this hard work. And you talked about pleasure and joy and laughter and that's probably my word, but those things. And I, I think a lot about some of the men who are survivors that I know in my life or that I've worked with, um, you know, in my professional role. And so many of them are like, oh, I go to massage so that they'll be, they'll kind of like beat me up. You know, they'll be really firm and they'll be really hard and they'll work my muscles. And I love when I hear from men in particular that they want to go and have light, soothing touch that just feels good not that it's supposed to be like this therapeutic piece but it's therapeutic yeah. in a different way so right kind of reframing what's possible in that body yeah. space and i think that male survivors are they're navigating so so many different things right like each population of survivors we have the things that we share that are you know that we navigate together as a collective of survivors and we have the unique ways in which society is like getting in the way of our own healing process because of social norms and conditioning and i hear that a lot from male survivors too this um you know like liking this high intensity things like 
mixed martial arts because they want to get beat up. Because for some survivors, and I think that part of that is that the, the, the paradigm of what it is to be a boy or masculine presenting or male of like the toughness is how they know they're alive. Like that intensity is how they know they're alive. And survivors can experience that like across cross genders, of course. But I do tend to hear that also a lot with with men is like, I don't even know I'm here unless it's so intense for me. And so I really think that it's like, okay, that's some wisdom there. Like, this is so cool. This is how we're, this is a door. Right. How can we help you get to the place where it doesn't have to hurt, right? Right. Like where right. it doesn't have to ache for you to feel yourself. And yeah. that is so, that's like, that's delicate, right? And, um, and so I just really honor that for, I honor that there's just these different barriers for, for all of us. And thank you for saying it much better than what I did, which is like, you know, yeah, we need to honor that space. If somebody's in the, I want to be in the beat me up, but I want to be so in pain after I'm done with this, you know, massage or this, this yoga or this, whatever it is, we can honor that as where somebody is. And we can also maybe help show that there's maybe something else if they would like to go there or not. Right. And that's okay right. because they will know, they know what they need. Right. Right. And it's like, there may be this familiarity of that dynamic because I will I've had people just say oh I like it when the yoga teacher I've heard this from men I like it when the yoga teacher bosses me around which I is not a very trauma-informed way to teach yoga and I'm like so okay so there's something about the familiarity of that relationship whether it's being bossed around or getting worked so hard you're in pain the next day from your massage but then what do you do? Then you kind of come in and you give yourself a bath or you put this, you put the special cream on. So how do we get to that, that cream state of self-caring and tending to your body? Could we, could we get there without the pain, you know? And what, what would that look like? Like, we know that ultimately you want to get into some kind of tending relationship with your body but it seems like right now this is the way you get there. Maybe over time there's a different way we could get there that that doesn't require you to suffer to to do that without without like um, shaming or pathologizing anybody's practices for how they manage, right? Because we're all just managing the best we can, and a lot of the way we manage is exactly. not conscious. It's amazing because, like, you know, you're right. Like, you know, some people want to be bossed around. They want to have that direction. And sometimes having that structure, you talked about structure in the beginning, about like having the container, having a little bit of structure, that's useful. But for some people, they want this kind of extreme level of structure of like, tell me what to do, boss me around. And um, before we talked today, I was thinking about, um, I've had very limited experiences with yoga because of my disabilities and I've just not found the right place and time to do that. But when I've experienced yoga, I had people touching me to get me into a certain position. And I think people are fearful of like, yes, I'd like to do yoga. It sounds really good, you know, but they're worried about some of those. Am I going to be touched or is my space going to get invaded? Can you talk a little bit about how your approach is different? Cause I'm, certain that it is different yeah yeah so i would never touch anybody without their consent and i um you know in a public yoga class i'm i'm not touching anybody i consider all of my yoga classes whether they're titled trauma-informed yoga or not i'm going to teach in a trauma-informed way so even having things like consent cards i still think that there's a pressure as the student to say, yes, I do consent to your touch. Um, I still think that there's an ex expectation for most yoga teachers that the yoga students will want to be touched. And so we have a lot of work to do in the yoga teaching community to let yoga teachers know that actually it's okay if the alignment of your students isn't perfect. It's okay if it doesn't look like you think it should look. What would it be like for you to just, like, that says more about the yoga teacher. Like, that's your work to do if that's hard for you to see that. If someone is going to hurt themselves because of something they can, they're doing, 
use your words. Like there's no reason you need to ever put your hands on a student's body in a yoga class unless they're about to fall over. If someone's about to fall, I'm gonna I'm gonna catch them and we'll figure out the touch. We'll we'll work together afterwards. But my number one priority is their immediate safety in that moment. But there's no need to ever put your hands on somebody's body. And so I think for yoga students, it's a really valid concern. I am a yoga teacher. I've been practicing yoga for 20, over 20 years. And I still worry about yoga teachers coming over. The minute they start kind of like, it's like a little shark. They're like getting closer and closer to my mat. And I feel myself being like, sending, I'm like trying to send out energetic signals of like, don't touch me, don't touch me, don't touch me. Um, so I have learned through trial and error, which teachers will ask for permission to touch and which teachers won't. And I don't go to places where I don't know who the teacher is. I don't take classes anymore with subs unless I know what their substitute teachers, unless I know the expectation is that they will ask. Um, but for me as a survivor, it's just better if I don't have to deal with having to answer that question. I just don't want to get touched. When I work with people individually, we can talk about it and they can, and we can say like, oh, do you want, do you like hands-on assist? And they might say, I have no problem with that. Cause some survivors, they don't care at all about that. Right. And so I don't make assumptions either that all survivors don't like touch some. It's like, this is the place they get touch that feels healing and safe. So I'm always going to be in conversation and I really trust like my teacher's been teaching yoga for 40 something years. You know, her practice looks like you think it would look in the yoga books. She almost never puts her hands on people's bodies. She's like, I really trust that people can come into their own alignment just through building that relationship with themselves over time and coming back to their practice. And I can come in with words, but like finding your alignment from the inside out is for me like the best kind of yoga. So um, yeah, I just want to, you know, encourage people who are looking for a class. They might look for a teacher that says they've done trauma-informed yoga training. They might email that teacher and be like, hey, what does trauma-informed yoga mean for you? What does that mean in your space? They might ask the studio how they navigate trauma-informed classes, things like that. Um, because it it is, unfortunately, it is one of those high-risk places where touch is likely to happen. And people are going to make assumptions that because you walked in the door, you've consented to something, which is not true. So I, along with many other trauma-informed yoga teachers, we are doing our work with the yoga community to try to let them know, like, no, nobody gave you consent to touch just by showing up for your space. They don't consent to anything but checking out your class and they have a right to leave. And they also have the right to do whatever they want to do in your class as long as it's not causing anybody else harm. Um, and I really hope that that sinks in for people that are listening to this podcast of really knowing, I mean, it's kind of like knowing what your rights are and, you know, knowing what you should be able to experience or not experience, which is. Yeah. Amazing. And I think for anyone who's listening, who is like a healing professional, I really invite healing professionals to go into spaces that aren't known to them and remember what it feels like to not know how to do something or to feel a little weird. And so that humility is so important for us, whether we are yoga teachers or nurse practitioners or advocates, like we have come to know our space really well that we think it's normal. But for survivors in our spaces, this this is not gonna be normal or natural. It's gonna take time. As we're wrapping up today, um, one of the taglines for this podcast series is let's listen, let's learn, let's heal. And we've talked about all of those things um, in our time together, but as you hear those phrases, so let's listen, let's learn, let's heal. Does something come up for you, especially as related to male or masculine identifying survivors? Yeah. You know, I think we live in a culture where um, male and masculine folks actually aren't told or taught how to listen to their bodies. Like they're often actually encouraged to override their bodies. And we 
in some ways have sort of gendered, like who gets to listen, who gets to have emotions. Um, we've gendered who gets to go into healing spaces. So when I think of like, let's listen and let's learn and let's heal for male survivors, my invitation is like, A, the word let's is like, let's is a collaboration. And so this is something we do together. And because I come from such a body influenced framework, it's like, how can you as a male survivor partner with your body and actually listen to your body? But can that be a place where you go and do your listening? Because that for me is a place where you're going to do the bulk of your learning, like listening inside, even if it's like when I listen, I don't hear anything. There's learning there. When I listen, I feel rage, such good learning. When I listen, I feel stomach ache, more learning, you know, and I feel like it's that listening to our body, that letting ourselves be educated by our own body is where is how we go on this this next, this next phase of our healing journey. And I want to say next phase because I want anyone who's listening to know that I believe that even if you've never formally stepped into a healing space, you are healing. I think that the minute you are in the throes of figuring out how am I going to survive this sexual abuse right now, you're already actually engaging the same physiology that is part of your healing process. And so you listening today means you've done so much healing to get here. And I think adding in some of that, like these new layers, whatever that looks like for you, that's just like taking that next step. And all of us have another step to take or another layer to go into. It's so nonlinear. And um, I just want to just affirm um, your right to listen to yourself and to trust yourself and to believe your own experience that is a perfect wonderful place for us to to wrap unless if you have anything else that you want to share do you want to share anything that we haven't talked about i know we could talk for hours about no i mean i think if you're looking for more resources um male focused um you know and you're not seeing them clearly spelled out on the breathe network's website um, I invite you, you can email me, molly at thebreathenetwork.org, um, and I can work with you to kind of identify either spaces or practitioners in your area or online, folks that have um, greater specialty and really have walked this journey of either being a male survivor or really focusing on supporting male survivors. Um I have really, really, really enjoyed our time together today. Um, I always like talking to you. We don't get to talk very often. Um, and I'm really, really glad that that we get to to share you out in the world with people who may not um, know about you, may not have known about the Breathe Network before today. Um, so thank you for your time and for your, your path to get to where you are, which is um, just such a beautiful and amazing place. So thank you very, very much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Just Healing. Join us for new episodes throughout 2024, where we will continue to spread messages of hope and healing and welcome Just Healing's two other new co-hosts, Dr. Greg Kaysen and Jace Barron. It's going to be an exciting year. And remember, you are worthy, you are loved. Trauma doesn't define any of us. Healing is possible, and it's a collective journey. This podcast was produced by Dr. Deborah and me, Michael Munson, in collaboration with Men Healing, a national nonprofit organization dedicated to helping provide accessible resources and community for any male or masculine identifying individual who has experienced sexual harm. You can donate, check out our healing events, videos, and other resources at menhealing.org. If you or someone you know has been a victim of or experienced sexual harm and you need to talk to someone, RAIN can help. Call their National Sexual Assault Hotline to speak with a trained staff member who can provide you with confidential crisis support. It's free, 
It's confidential and it's available 24 seven. You can call 1-800-656-4673, or you can go to their web-based chat support. You can reach it at hotline.rain.org. That's H-O-T-L-I-N-E dot R-A-I-N-N dot O-R-G.